Um, good afternoon, Mr. Shigekawa. Well, good afternoon to you. Um, so please start by telling us your name, your birth date, where you was born, and where do you live now? Okay, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jerry Shigekawa. Um, I was born in uh, Poston, Arizona, which is an internment camp. It was called Poston One you know, on August 18th, 1942. I now reside in Santa Ana, and so I've always had Orange County roots. You know, come back. I think uh, for a very, very brief time, I, I, I never lived outside of Orange County, so I consider myself almost an Anaheim homeboy or a native Californian. And uh, our family got its roots here. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1877 in Japan. He uh, immigrated, came in through the gates of San Francisco with his two brothers. One brother was a, a Baptist minister, the other one was a doctor. And my grandfather opened a restaurant in San Francisco and he ran that business until 1906 when the uh, 1906 earthquake devastated San Francisco. And so uh, one brother who was a, a doctor, an MD, he, he remained in San Francisco, my grandfather uh, and his brother, uh, they uh, ended up in uh, Orange County in Anaheim. Uh, 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 the original home where they settled was uh, is now uh, in the rough, approximate vicinity of La Palma and State College. That was what we eventually what we known up until the, the early 70s as the Sugar Cow Ranch. Uh, my uh, second uncle, which is my grandfather's brother, opened the uh, Japanese Baptist Church, which was on uh, where Citron and La Palma meet. Uh, it's no longer there, but they, they use the, uh, the minister there. And uh, they, uh, my grandfather opened a uh, restaurant very close to the museum. So two blocks up, it's uh, about a block away from uh, Washington Elementary School. He kept that for many years. Eventually ended up being uh, the, uh, sold the restaurant. Uh, uh, I can't recall the date. But for many years, it was called, uh, uh, it was the storefront uh, for uh, Lieb Electric, Lieb Electric. I think. And uh, we kept the ranch. My grandfather uh, planted uh, about every 50 acres of orange grove. Uh, if you, you know where presently Romnia, State College, E Street, and La Palma, there's 50 acres in there. And my grandfather planted uh, every tree himself. So he was, uh, uh, he, so we kind of, without uh, you know, uh, seeking any notoriety, he was one of uh, one of the pioneer orange growers in the Anaheim area. So the orange growers were all around us here in that area on the west side. If you if you divided Anaheim into a quadrant where you have which is uh, now La Palma or North Street, that was the north end of Anaheim. South Street here was the south end, you have East Street and West Street. Those are the boundaries of what was called the original colony of uh, Anaheim. And the Germans had their vineyards and the wineries on the, uh, the west side of town, very close to now where you see the Disneyland office buildings, that green building, were right there. There used to be a huge uh, brick warehouse there and a storage. Uh, it was there until the late 50s. I remember going by there, it was a German winery. People don't remember that, but I remember going by that. That was a very, uh, that was a similar location. And so that's where Manchester came through there now. Now that's all part of Disneyland. Yeah. And so uh, uh, then my, my, my father was born in, in um, uh, he was uh, born in 1902, but he grew up here in Anaheim, uh, graduated from uh, Anaheim High in uh, 1929. And uh, all my uncles we had, let's see, one, two, three, th uh, four, four, he had four brothers and a sister, all uh, with the exception of one graduated from Anaheim High. The exception was my uncle 
William or Bill, uh, he could not graduate from Anaheim High. He had to do it this, a, uh, uh, because we were, when the War War II came, we were re relocated. So he was in Poston, and he got his uh, degree in abs his diploma in absentia uh, in Poston. All right. But other than that, all my uncles and sisters, and also my second cousins, were uh, graduates of Anaheim High. And, and uh, I was born in '42. We left uh, uh, Poston uh, in uh, uh, in the late uh, summer, early fall of 1945, when the uh, uh, relocation uh, was over. We came back and we settled. Uh, in the uh, our ranch house on the Palma and State, where it's now State College. We lived there in our family, in our extended family. There's 20 of us living there for a while until we got things settled. But uh, after World War II, people don't realize that World War II started at the end of the Great Depression. And when we came back here into Orange County, we were still, in, in, even though the post war post-war economy was starting to pick up and the economy war was over, uh, things were starting to shift. It was still kind of a depressed economy. We know that for a fact, we saw in jobs were in a way, things were busy, but it was hard to find jobs. Uh, my, my father went to work, uh, working for Pete Lair Trucking, who hauled, as a trucking company, was uh, specialized in hauling oranges. He, uh, one of the first jobs working, driving a, a truck hauling oranges when they were picked to, from the orange groves to the packing houses. He did that uh, for, for a number of years uh, at about $6 a day at that time. So with $6 a day, that was, that was the resource we had to feed uh, all of uh, 20 of us uh, living in, on the palm in a, in a ranch uh, style house. Uh, on, the, on the Palma State College. And um, had a sister, one sister was born uh, in uh, 44 in Poston, and my other sister, the youngest one, she was born out of camp, and she was born in um, the Fullerton Hospital up here. But she was, so uh, she was the only really, uh, we say, a native born Orange County. Right now. All right. and, uh, well, if you want to focus on World War II, that period, when the, the uh, war broke out on December 7th, uh, my father at the time was working as a commercial fisherman on Terminal Island. And my mother was a registered pharmacist. Uh, she was a licensed pharmacist. Uh, she owned a drugstore. Uh, she uh, got her uh, degree in, in pharmacy from uh, USC. And was running a drugstore there. And so my father was a fisherman there, and they met up and they got married. Then when the, uh, after December 7th, um, uh, all those that were in Orange County were uh, essentially rounded up and told to get to uh, the train station in LA. And there's a number of assembly centers around. One was in Santa Anita, uh, known on Terminal Island, but everyone was essentially rounded up, put on trucks. You had, you could take one trunk, one suitcase, uh, and that was your belongings, and you were to go board the train. Now, most of the Japanese um, Americans in Orange County were sent to post in Arizona, which was the largest of the internment camps. Uh, eventually, it was built to hold 19,000 in three phases. We were there, uh, uh, my, my grand, uh, grandparents and my parents got there in the first phase, it was a post in one. We were in uh, what we call, uh, it was uh, uh, Block 21, Building 10, a post in one. And that's where I spent the first three years of my life <laughs> in, in, in Arizona. So since I consider myself a native Arizonian, Dash California at the time, yeah. and uh, um, my father was uh, he was appointed as the chief of police for the uh, uh, 
post and police department we had a um, and, and those, even those called an internment camp, and it wasn't in a sense a concentration camp. They called a concentration camp would be, uh, a, 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 say, a degrading of the real concentration camps that we see in Europe. Uh, so there wasn't any, uh, we didn't have the infamous gas showers or the crematoriums, but in a sense it was a confined area. There were armed guards, barbed wire, uh, the uh, uh, housing with just a wooden frame with tar paper and wire around it, no insulation. So imagine black tar paper, a black roof, and the Arizona sun, so the triple digit weather, the heat could get up to 120 degrees at some days inside of Barrett. So, but uh, uh, the, the uh, internment camps, the one in Poston was, uh, in a sense, it was a groundbreaking experiment between the uh, Bureau, of, uh, Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, where they were, wanted to solve an underlying problem between the, the uh, relocation of the Hopi Indians and the Navajos. The Hopi Indians uh, were, had been uh, settled in part of the great Navajo Nation. And they, the Hopis always wanted to be autonomous. So the great plan of the uh, Department of Indian Affairs, well, let, let's send them to Arizona where we have the Colorado River, there's water, there's uh, fertile soil, they can have their own land. So, but we had to intervene uh, World War II. Now we had all these people, the Japanese, uh, who were uh, known for truck farming, they said this is a great way to start, to, to be the embryonic start of self-sufficiency that the Hopis can come and take over. They could be a, a, a farming community. And, and so that was, that was the ulterior motive of uh, establishing uh, the post and internment camp at that time. But uh, it, uh, uh, for some reason, if you follow the history of it, it, it didn't work out. The intentions were well, but it did not work out. The Hopis are still living uh, within the, the boundaries and the borders of the Navajo Reservation, and they, they're still seeking to have their own uh, sovereign nation. There's always a fight between the, the Hopi and the Navajos, which is, still exists today. And uh, so after uh, 45, I think it was in the the spring of 45, the war were winding down. Then the war ended and we were allowed to return to uh, Orange County. And I remember the days where we all, uh, even though I was three years old, I remember distinctly where we packed everything in, in trucks in a caravan across the desert from uh, the Colorado River to Desert Center. And uh, in those days, you didn't have air conditioning in cars or trucks. So the first night, I remember that we uh, pull over the side and we uh, actually just slept on the berm of the road there, on the road uh, uh, between Indio and Desert Center. Eventually, we came back to Orange County, and after uh, uh, you know three or four years, a lot of the houses, no one was living in there, so quite the houses were quite run down, remember that when we opened the, the house, over oh, oh, there, there's rats in there and we had to clean that up before uh, uh, to make it uh, habitable uh, for a living. So that was quite an adventure, but it was fun. We were living in Orange Grove. You know, I, I, we were very fortunate we had uh, neighbors, uh, uh, Herb Selvison, Bill Greger, a uh, friend Elliot, uh, in the, in the a family called the Edisons who were contiguous with our ranch that, that oversaw it. So our, our, uh, the Sugar Collar Ranch was still relatively intact. Uh, uh, so it was, even though it was small and after it was cleaned up, it was uh, habitable. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1948, we left that, my family, and my uh, mother and father, and uh, my two sisters, we moved out here to a house, we rented a house on Cerritos Avenue, 
very close to where Cerritos Avenue now dead ends into Anaheim Boulevard. Uh, it's now the house that we rented in there is now is gone. There's now an Edison substation there. Oh. It's on the corner of Cerritos and Lewis Street there. That was all oranges at the time. And we had a big horse corral in the back. So I grew up around oranges, horses, and I uh, was still orange trees is relatively that part of town right now. You could drive there in one moment you think, oh, you're still in town, but it, uh, in the 40s and 50s, that was considered out in the sticks and the boonies. We used to go out there and hunt jackrabbits with their 22s, which is unheard of now. You know? <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's where I grew up in the, the first school I attended uh, was uh, down here, Abraham Lincoln School. Yeah. And uh, uh, school was a kind of a, a cultural shock because you have to remember that from approximately 40, 1942 to 1945, 46, there were no Japanese in the state of California. So here's some kids that are growing up among Caucasians, white, you know, they didn't know what Orientals were. You know? And they don't know, they didn't know the difference between a Filipino, Malaysian, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and so forth. Everyone's considered with the war that everything was considered, you know, what they, what they call everyone was a Jap at the time, yeah. you know? So it, it's still some of the, the prejudice. And, and remember that uh, uh, we uh, suffered, you know, it wasn't suffering, but you had to endure some strange, uh, prejudicial uh, acts of the kids. You know, okay, hey, you Chinese, Korean, or what, you know, they call you the Ching Chong Chinaman, something like that. And I remember, oh, one day, you know what a bento box is for lunch? Okay, so I won one day, I was going, I was in first, I think it was second grade at Catella School. My mother fixed me a bento box. Okay, so and everyone else at that time had sack lunches or sandwiches. Right. You know? So I took my bento lunch. I didn't think anyone, because we do it at home. I sit there eating it. And everybody looked around me. They didn't seen anyone use chopsticks or eating that. What's that? Oh, that, that, that's, that's rice and raw fish. That's pickled vegetable. Everybody called <laughs> I was sitting there eating it. I remember that one of my classmates, John Nellison, came up to me. He comes up to me and says, Hey, Shug. They call me Shug. He says, would you want to trade an egg salad sandwich or a piece of sushi? <laughs> he said, I never tasted it. He says, sure. So I gave him a piece of a cone sushi. He says, this is great. They let me know when you bring this again. So, so at the time, the, right now, you know, the big thing is uh, upscale eating of the sushi bars. I remember people looked at, oh, yeah, I want to eat that. <laughs> you know? Same thing and, happened to my friend. <laughs> And so it's, it's, it's amazing how things come around full circle. Mm -hmm. I remember how the prejudice, uh, led, I mean, because if you go down here where um, uh, Lincoln and the I, uh, I-5 come together, they used to be Manchester. Then the original, I think the Bridgeford Packing Company used to be there before they moved over here. Well, they kept a little um, cafe there called the Bridgeford Cafe. And I remember I was working with my dad one day, we we're driving the trucks. We pulled into the Bridford Cafe and then we got a truck and went into the dining room, sat down at their uh, counter in the stool. And we looked up, my dad sees a sign in a frame there and it said, Jap Honey License. This entitles an order to kill one Jap, you know, at the time, you know, patriotic. So, but that asked him, who we'll put that up there? You know? and so so next, next time we went there, it was gone. I remember we had it, ordered a sandwich and a Coke went out. But you still see the prejudice even there. That, that, that was about 46, 47. The prejudice was still there. Yeah. So uh, that, that was some of the experiences. I remember that um, in the uh, early 50s, uh, the big thing, um, the, the way in which we had our, our uh, educational system, we had all these elementary schools in the city, 
We started on the east end, it was Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, then we had Horseman, Benjamin Franklin, Centralia, Leo Loera, and we had all these, all these elementary schools. And in the summer, uh, everyone was in their elementary schools, but summer was great because we had the YMCA camp. We all went to save our money to go to the YMCA camp, and that's where everyone uh, went up there and met all, all different boys that came from different, uh, different elementary schools. I remember that uh, there weren't too many Japanese students <laughs> in the district, so I was one of the one of the few there, and so we befriended a lot of people. Uh, uh, a lot of things I have now we met at the YMCA camp back in those early days, and, and then when we went to junior high, it was only one junior high, which was uh, Fremont Junior High School, is now torn down. But we all came together there. We know we met. So I knew every from from YMCA summer camp. Then we all then we went over to Anaheim High. At that time, Anaheim was the only one. Then the next one that opened up was uh, uh, Western, and Brookers was the second junior high that opened up. So I remember that, that, that was a, a good time in those days because uh, everyone kind of knew everyone, and even Anaheim High was a pretty big school. We had close to I think third between 3,800 and 4,000 students there because it was the only high school uh, in the city. And, uh, um, so that's where I uh, went from Fremont to uh, Anaheim. Uh, had a, uh, thinking back on that, those are golden years because that's where everyone, uh, Anaheim was still a town we could identify it. We had all the stores here in Center Street, which are now gone. But it was a, a, a it was like a piece of Norman Rockwell's Americana. You know, people would know everyone. You walk down the, the, the streets, and uh, you know everyone on Friday night. The stores would, would was the only night where they stayed open late till nine o'clock, and everyone would come into town and, uh, and see everyone. And it, it, it's, it's a great place to live, and of course on Friday nights, everyone would go to the football game. And we'd get, in those days, we'd get 20, 25,000 in La Palma Stadium. It was, it was huge, it was great. So I had a, I was able to play football there, it was a great time. And then from there, uh, I went to uh, uh, Fulton Junior College, it's now Fulton College. Then I went to Pomona College and finished up, got my bachelor's there and did some graduate work in Long Beach State. Then I uh, uh, got my first uh, coaching job at uh, uh, Servite High back in the, in, in the late, uh, well, it was the mid-60s. But uh, those are the college years and, and the high school years were a great time. And, and um, in high school, it's great. One of our student body presidents was Bob Hatfield of the Righteous Brothers. You remember him? Uh, Bobby was our, uh, he was uh, uh, head of the office of sophomore, he was a senior. Uh, but his brother, John, or we call him Butch, he and I were very close friends. Uh, he was, uh, uh, we call him Butch. He was one of, uh, when I got married, he was one of our ushers. And I, uh, so the Righteous Brothers and uh, my wife was a good friend of Bill Smithley. Oh. We knew each other, so uh, all those were had deep roots in Orange County. We had a, uh, so it was, it was great growing up in, in Anaheim. When you look back on it, you know, of course we had uh, Anaheim. They were the the. Anyone's Oriental, there, there's, I can only, I can count on my hand the Chinese students. The only student was, was Steve Young from the Young family who lived in West Anaheim. Uh, then there's, uh, I think, the Kubotas, uh, let's see, Osumis. I think there's probably less than 10 families that were in the high school. So anyone, so all the Japanese were, we, we were the really minority. But all our friends were also like some of our friends were uh, uh, what we call them Chicanos. <laughs> they had all uh, all the Caucasians, but it, it was a melting pot. Everyone got along well. 
you know, but we, we'd always have our little, we'd, you know, be hung around with that, uh, you know, color, race, we just, they were all totally transparent. Everyone was, uh, knew everyone, in a, in a sense. So th those problems didn't exist. If, if it was, it, we didn't see it in our school. All right. So, uh, uh, any other questions I could answer for you? Or? Are you still friends with any of um, the friends that you have in high school? So friends? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we still have a uh, alumni group. There's a group of us. Uh, once a year, uh, they, we meet down at Tony's Deli. It's everyone who played football at Anaheim. And there's a, uh, survivors from going back to uh, the 1930s, 40s, all the way up that we meet. Of course, there's less and less of us, but we meet once a year. That we have, and I have a core group of uh, friends that uh, we, we'll probably go back to uh, eighth grade in Fremont Junior High School. We were in the same class together, we stayed together, we played football, we went back, but afterwards we did things. And once a year, we call the staff and we call up and says, Hey, is it time for a staff meeting? So we pick someone's house and we meet up with the wives. And, and reminisce about the old days and talk about the new things. We have people that come in from all parts of the country. One, uh, Dean uh, Rayall, he lives up in uh, uh, Kinnick, Washington. He comes down if, when he can. And, uh, so we have, we, we call it, everyone calls us a bro. It's like a brother. <laughs> we, we, we keep in, in touch. Uh, uh, there's some friends down there, they're all, I guess everyone, when you graduate, everybody scatters out. So there's now, and then that I run into, uh, uh, we cross paths of uh, uh, small world stories where I look at us and say, hey, I looked at someone, aren't you so and so? You sure look like someone I can know my daughter if it isn't. <laughs> well, that's what it happens. Some, there's a run across someone that has some ties with Orange County or Anaheim. Uh, so, we, there, there's still some long, uh, some very uh, long established friendships we still maintain. Uh, but we're getting up there in years. Uh, most of my class, we can't think, yeah, it's hard to believe we're, you know, mid-70s now, rapidly approaching their 80s. And so, we maintain some of those, uh, even though they're, they're not very, they don't meet very often, but they're very close relationships. I don't know you mean. Um, go back to the, in, the evacuation. Did your parent ever tell you how they feel about it? Yeah, well, uh, it's the uh, genre and the culture of the Japanese uh, that prevented everyone from talking about. Now my sister's a little different. She's written two books, and she's made a, made two documentaries on it. Uh, she wants to speak out. Of course, she doesn't. Even, she was uh, she was a little about a year and a half when she left, so she doesn't remember too much. But she's catching from secondhand experience. I remember some firsthand things from the relocation. I, rem I remember it vividly. Uh, near the end of relocation when everyone was kind of packing up and getting ready to so to go back to Orange County, come back into Orange County, that uh, some people were really apprehensive of what they would mean. I remember that we were playing out, uh, uh, I was playing outside one of the barracks and uh, someone came running down I know what was going on, but they ran into this one barrack for a family where the Shinto family was around. We didn't know what was going on, so the kids, we were in there, and we in, there's Mr. Shinto, we saw him hanging, he hung himself. I remember that very vividly. And my dad, being a chief of police, and he came down, they rushed him, and they, and they tried to uh, revive him, but, it was, but that was a sad time. And uh, uh, that, that was, one one of the things that I remember quite vividly. Of course, there's some good times too in the uh, in the camp. 
One of the things that we had after uh, uh, lunch, you know, some of one of the things in a Japanese diet is rice. All right. So when you cook rice, actually you scoop out the rice. The bottom of the rice is the brown rice. Well, that was kind of a delicate because the cooks would kick, scoop that out, and it's like eating candy. So we'd wait after lunch, and we'd go after when the, when, about an hour later, they open the door and they hand that out to us. Oh. Uh, that, that was a treat. And, and uh, also, um, now and then, that we had some of our friends, uh, remember, I can remember the, it was uh, Eric and Fritz Borchard were uh, friends of our, uh, that, that my dad grew up with, uh, Lawrence Natal, um, let's see, um, and so parents would, would come and visit us at a camp, and they would bring us uh, crates of fresh oranges. And also the Borchard brothers, they, they were truck farmers, so they bring us fresh cabbage and celery and fresh vegetables at the time. So I remember that when they come to the oranges, and you know, it was a rare to get fresh oranges. And I remember well, one time uh, we went, we got permission to be escorted up from Poston, Arizona to Manzanar up here, where uh, my mother's grandparents were. We had a person to go up and pick them up and come down. And so we took up uh, uh, a crate of oranges to them, and that camp had not seen fresh oranges for two or three years, so that was a rare treat. I remember was eating those. I remember how we had that. And, uh, so that was a, a a nice trip up there. And also, I remember that right across from Manzanar, there was an auxiliary airfield. And the being in Arizona, it's the middle of nowhere. And you saw nothing. All you in the sky, you always see birds. And I heard this big roar. And the first airplane I'd seen was a silver twin engine P 38 that was taking off from that. I remember this to this day. And I thought, and says, what is that? <laughs> And I looked that up, and there is that Lockheed did maintain an airfield out there for, test, for testing as a merchant landing. I said, yeah, I didn't imagine. I did see that. Yeah. So there was, those are some of, the, some of the few highlights. And uh, um, they're, they're, uh, as far as speaking about it, not too many, uh, to get back to your question, that the Japanese do, do not speak of it, although my dad and four others decided to do something about it in my corporate. And he sued, brought suit in violation of the, the Fourth Amendment against what we call the Far Defense, the, the Western Defense Command, to sue to, to get the right to come back into California. So just a, we kept this in here. This this is the kind of a proceedings of the case. It's one that uh, is a, you don't hear too much about it, but it is a landmark case. The first time that anyone sued the, the U.S. Army. The people don't realize when you had it well, on uh, January second, uh, nineteen forty-two, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order nine uh, nine uh, nine zero six six which set up the, the, the evacuation. Anyone's Japanese an, uh, heritage and ancestry was to be rounded up. And shortly thereafter that, uh, Secretary of War Henry Stinson passed what they call Common Law 103. And what that did was establish martial law. Now you know what martial law is? That means martial law essentially is robbing yourself of any due process. So at this time, martial law was, was declared, which meant that the army and the police had total uh, discretionary functions to arrest, shoot, and uh, they, anyone that violated uh, Executive Order 9066. So it's like if you had someone right now, uh, and today if someone wanted a protest and walked down the street, they might, unless they violate a law, blocking or, uh, let's say, violating a code enforcement, they would be arrested. But martial law says you do that and you're going to be either uh, deadly force or 
let's say, incarceration will be the result. And it's a very, one of the few times that martial law had ever been declared in the United States. So uh, that was one of the effects of World War II. And, uh, so uh, uh, we just we kept that, and I was looking at some of the memorabilia that we had, and this, and that's all in there. And uh, also brought some of our memorabilia to get an idea of what it was like uh, from our uh, from our perspective to grow up in Orange County uh, in Anaheim uh, from the post-war era. Now, I don't know what it was like in World War II because we weren't here. <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, I guess, um, those that uh, we spoke to that lived here in World War II said, well, it was, even though we had rationing, everyone had, uh, there was no shortage of anything. There's plenty of food, uh, fuel, and so forth, but it just, you just couldn't get it when you wanted it. <laughs> it's a ration. And uh, that's, that's, that, that was a uh, you know, sense of life here in Orange County. And uh, if, uh, let's see, uh, well, I'll get back to the question of what, what's going on in World War II. Uh, or my, or my family's perspective would be we spent most of it in an internment camp. <laughs> you know. uh, but we had, uh, uh, four uncles and cousins who served in the armed forces. I had one uncle served in the Army Air Corps. I had uh, uh, three uncles that served in the infantry and what we call the 442nd Combat Regimental Team, uh, who fought in Italy. I had one uncle who stayed post uh, uh, after the war in uh, uh, he was in occupation. Uh, he stayed in. Uh, uh, in Germany, I, I had a second uncle who was an interpreter with Morales Marauders in Burma, and my family thought that he was lost as casually after the war. He was like a missing in action, assuming he was killed. And about I think it was almost two years after World War II ended, he he walked out of the jungle. He survived all those years. His name was Takashi Shigakawa. If you look that up, you'll see that he was one of the surviving members of Morales Marauders there in that, what they call the India Burma Theater. So he's kind of a hero to it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, another uncle who served in the 1st Marine Division who went ashore on the invasion craft of a lot of the uh, islands as they're hopping from uh, Tarawa, Tinian, Okinawa. And uh, so we had, uh, so I think we had some family pride in our uncles that served and they all, luckily they, they all came back. Did you have any family in Japan? Yes. And we have some relatives that, in fact, uh, Takashi, when he, after, he came, after he came out of the jungle, he stayed uh, post-war in Japan for a number of years and kind of, then he repaid repatriated back to the States in about the 50s. Yeah. So that was kind of a miracle war story. Uh, an amazing feat of survival. Uh, and let's see. Um, Do you know why your family made a decision to come back to Orange County after the the evacuation was over? Okay, well one part of it, uh, during the evacuation as the war was proceeding uh, in, the, in the favor of the Allies, uh, some of the restrictions, the relocation were lifted and so they allowed some of the internees in the, in the camps to go outside. Uh, like my aunt, she went to Chicago you know, to work as a dental assistant. Uh, we had uh, my dad uh, after, uh, he, of course, he was a chief of police, but there was really no need of it. So he uh, got an opportunity to go work in Kansas City uh, for a corrugated uh, cardboard company. But he went back east and saw it. The weather 
I said, that's not for him. He wants to come back to Orange County. <laughs> and a lot, there's a lot of that, uh, you know, that went outside. Of the, well, the, in, a, in a way, the internment was good. It was allowed some people to get out of the shell of living in, in the, let's say, the Japanese ghettos, if you could call it that way, uh, out and expand uh, to see other parts uh, of the world. Uh, we had a, an aunt that went to New York. She, she went in there, um, met her husband, and she stayed there for many years. When she came back, I swear she talked just like a bada bing, bada boom, like a New Yorker. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. You know, here, here's a, a Japanese American. She talked like she, she was a, an Italian New Yorker. We always we kidding her about that. That was funny. So, in a way, that was good allowed. Uh, also, some attorneys that were at college age, they were allowed to go to uh, outside some college. Like my uncle went, uh, one of my uncles was allowed to get into the University of Michigan. He got a degree in chemistry. So, in a way, it allowed him to expand their horizons to some degree. Um, some people say that. Um, the Japanese were happy to be in the camp because they got the protection from the American people. Um, what do you think about that? Well, that, that, I think that was a very minor point. Yeah. Because that, that was just a, a very small fringe element that were actually the, the prejudice that they're uh, picking on. Well, the most part here in Orange County, you didn't see the burning of, of the farms or anything. There, there was some uh, vandalism, but it's mostly minor. There isn't any protection. The worst part of it is just trying to survive. You didn't have to worry about protection of surviving, you know, in the in the desert. Uh, we were in in the, in the Sonoran, the lower Sonoran Desert. Uh, some camps were up in Utah and Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where it was minus, you know, a chill factor of, <laughs> of minus forty in the winter. You know, so you the the protection is not from uh, the, uh, let's say, harassment right, from the human factor is a, it was the environmental factors that, that would be more threatening. Do you think it's not, did your family feel that it wasn't fair because the government only did this to the Japanese American, but not to the Germans American or anyone from the World War I? Well, it, it, that, that could be an argument for that, but you have to remember why this took place. Remember, we had uh, the, uh, the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7th. Then shortly thereafter, we had a submarine that surfaced offshore here and started uh, uh, bombarding the oil fields here. So the war in California it wasn't just something you saw in news service. It was real. And so the threat of war at the time was very imminent. It was real. And you get, and there's a saying that war makes people do strange things. And so the war mentality created that. And there was prejudice. You see it all the way down the line. If you read some of the papers and the headlines, there's General DeWitt, who was the commander of the 4th Army, who was in charge of the far western defense, he says in paper, you'll see it, it says, I hate Japs, all Japs should be sent to the interior, or, or they can starve and, you know. So it was prejud there was prejudice from the highest levels down, but all fomented by the imminent threat of war. And so it was, a, it was, it was different then because the war was truly it was an imminent threat and that was the justification for declaring martial law and so when you have a war in martial law all rules are thrown out the war uh, it's not a fair fight any longer either politically or you know, in any way Um, did your parents tell you how they were treated before the war, internal prejudice against Asian people? No, they said they were treated very well. Oh. Yeah, there was a, uh, 
than any, any overt, um, let's say, segregated acts. I think everyone got along well because my dad was a commercial fisherman on Terminal Island. And on Terminal Island, you have a mixture of Slovakians, uh, Italians, Japanese, uh, all in the fishing community there. And so everyone got along well. Even after the war, my dad went back to fishing. I used to go down there with him. And most of the friends were also Japanese fishermen. They're also, we had the Greeks, we had the Slavonians, we had the Italians, the Yugoslavs in there and all that area. It was like a, a melting pot. So everyone got along well because they had a common goal. They, everyone worked hard, they, they, they loved what they did. And so I think that the common goal brought everyone together. Um, do your parents tell you any stories about before the war or while they were in the camp? I guess stories. Well, uh, before the war, just before the war, on uh, uh, on Sunday, December seventh, uh, right after the attack, my mother. Uh, I was born in August, mm -hmm. and she was carrying me, pregnant with me. Do you remember she was going to uh, a, uh, a Sunday gathering up in? Uh, Los Angeles. When the war came and they descended upon, they locked everyone up. And here she was all, you know, she was going to travel the other, but then she was pulled over or something, and they threw in this, in this fenced barbed wire enclosure on Terminal Island. And at that time, anyone that had uh, looked oriental was seized, rounded up, and thrown in this. Uh, this uh, Bob wire enclosure. So here's my mother all dressed up and there's all these others in there, mostly men. It's, 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 so she remember that. That was, that was a little traumatic for her. Uh, yeah. um, I would like to know the role of uh, religion in your family. The what's that? I'm sorry? The role of religion in your family. Well, the very, very purpose, my uh, grandfather, second uncle, uh, their, their uh, my uh, second uncle was an uh, ordained Baptist minister for the Anaheim Japanese Free Methodist Church up here, on, which was on Citroen. And, and, and my grandfather was very active in the church. He was active in this church here, the one down the Fountain Valley, for many years. So uh, it, it, it was an uh, integral part of it, but we didn't wear it on our sleeve. It was there. My, my grandfather was very, and I know that. On Sunday dinners, we always had, you know, we prayed, gave thanks to it. So it, it was, uh, uh, I think, an integral part of it, but it wasn't where we, where, where, where it, was, it wasn't the central focus of, of our daily lives, but it was there. It was, it was still practicing, actively practice, you know, the, everyone's form of religion. We had, you know, uh, Protestant Christian also had uh, some um, some Buddhists in the internment camps too, you know. So Shinto's in there. So it, it, it was uh, integrated into it, but it wasn't like a, uh, it didn't get to a point where it was so important it turned into a cult-like uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how did everyone get together in the camp? Celebrating holidays and... Well, the only thing that, that we had it was, the only place to get together is two places, the mess hall or outside we had the amphitheater. That's the only place. Remember at um, my, uh, 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 birthday, I remember my, uh, my second birthday, my dad went into Parker and he's able to get the bakery and come back and came back with a big cake. And we shared it with everyone there on my second. I think it was the second birthday. I remember he brought out, opened the box. I remember that very good. I said, you can't remember. Yes, you do. You remember things. Yeah. Yeah. And so that celebration, we, uh, in the later part, they built an amphitheater where we had outdoor movies um. because it was so hot. You know. So I remember in the summer, that was a great mission because I remember sitting on a wooden bench and uh, watching movies on the screen. 
It was so hot. There's nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. um, what did the people in the camp do to keep cool during summer and warm during winter? Do you know? Well, to keep cool, you, you, you certainly you want to spend less uh, uh, majority of the time outside those tar tar paper barracks. They're like ovens, uh, and so we just stayed outside. And some people slept outside. And then, uh, but unless there was a dust storm, you, you, you just learned to adapt uh, to that. There were later on. Remember that they brought in some what we call swamp coolers, those big boxes that put on top of the water water, but. Uh, that, that was some, uh, let's say, uh, way of getting some cooling into it, yeah, especially in the, uh, in the large gathering places, in, in the mess halls. But the air conditioning was few and far between because uh, most people don't know this, but the post and in, intern camps were built on a contract with Dell Webb was a very, very famous uh, uh, developer of uh, retirement communities. He's building Sun City at the time. And this is one of the s stories that my dad told me was chief of police that uh, they, they caught one of Del Webb's employees in a truck loaded with all the plumbing, and the building materials, they're taking it out of the uh, staging area where it came in by train and all that they're putting on, on, on trucks and taking it down to Dell Webb's uh, development at the time. So that, that's kind of a, a little subterfuge, a little forest acti nefarious activity that took place that you don't read about you know, in, the, in the history books. So my dad being a chief of police and all his deputies, and there's, these are big, tough, you know, you know farmers, they're, they're tough, and fishermen, they told him, you better not do this again. That should, because that was plumbing and electrical, uh, that's meant to, uh, you know, for the uh, internment camp. And they're here, they're taking government material and use it for their own private enterprise. <laughs> so. And how about during winter? How do you keep warm? Well, in anyway, the, the, the winter where we were, in winter it was the dust storms. Oh. So it, it didn't get really that cold, so we had to uh, take towels and anything to block all the seams in there to keep the dust and the cold out. Then we had uh, this, uh, this uh, space heating. Wood burning stoves was the only way to keep warm or in the clothing that, that you had that you brought. Uh, uh, but, uh, we had we were fortunate that we had friends that come visit the camp. And they brought us uh, knew, brought some warm clothing at the time. Yeah. So the the, the uh, Salvation Army and the Quakers did very well that. That furnished, uh, you know, some of the clothing for those that needed it. Yeah. Did people in the camp get update on what is what was going on with the war? Well, we're, yeah, it was very hard because all radios were confiscated. Um. Then later on, uh, they had uh, in the days of the black and white movies what they called movie tone news. Uh, so, well, during the latter part, remember we watched that. It showed the, the edited propaganda videos. Really. So, how successful we see the movie tone. That's where we got the yeah, outside. But as far as papers, uh, you know, there was a, uh, a local paper that was published within uh, the camp itself because everyone had their own uh, niche, so to speak, or their jobs. There were those that wrote at camp, wrote, just, just wrote things about someone's birthday and blah, 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 and they, they were able to gather some of that and put that into uh, the uh, internment camps, uh, let's say, uh, daily 
journal or their own. I think it, I, I, I can't remember if it was weekly or monthly, but it was written in, and put out by me, old fashioned mimeograph. Right. Um, do people, do people in the camp allow to have any contact with the outsider, the people in the town? Oh yeah. After a while, the first week you got there, it was, it was relative, it was a very secure camp. But later, the gates were essentially open. You could go into town, into Parker, which is not much of a town, but there's no no place to go. Where do you go? You know, it's a middle of nowhere. So, if you wanted uh, later on, in, I think in '44, '45, you could get. Uh, permission to, to go, if you wanted to go outside, you, you know, for a good reason, you were, you were allowed to go outside if you were, had some type of escort. Uh, 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 I can't remember uh, other than the trip to Manzanar. I, I, I don't recall of going outside of uh, posting itself uh, too often. As a kid, what did you do in the camp? Well, other things we played marbles, one thing. Steel marbles. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing. Uh, we do the thing. Uh, uh, the one thing we did uh, is that uh, the Mojave, we were, the camp was placed in the reservation of the Mojave Nation, the Indians. And so, I remember that now and then in would come a Mojave native on a horse. So the first time I see a horse, and so it'd be fun to ride a horse. So the thing we did was we'd get sticks and everything, stick a rope around it. That's a horse of mountain run around the camp like that as a horse. Every evening. So that that was one activity. Uh, uh, that's about play. I remember playing marbles, chase each other, mm -hmm. and other games. Well, I guess uh, they were uh, available, but I, I don't remember. That's the only thing that I can recall. Yeah. Were there a lot of um, kids at your age in the camp? Uh, not, not that many. Not, well, in our camp, not that many. Uh, most of them were, uh, were older. A little bit older, yeah. in my age, like uh, uh, pre-teens or early teens. There was a lot of that. Uh, I, the, all that is in records. It's archived someplace. The, the, the number of because there were there, there was a elementary grammar school and a high school uh, conducted within set up within the camp. So education was still as best as possible under the circumstances what was uh, continued. Did you go to school in the camp? No, I was only three years old, oh. so I didn't have it. Oh. So we didn't have preschool then, okay. or, or Montessori. <laughs> No, I don't think that uh, I. I don't think that thought ever came back. It's a, it's a matter of moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, because it was. Uh, it was a very unusual event that most people wanted to forget, because up until, well, maybe twenty years ago, and that it, it, any knowledge or any. Uh, let's say, uh, word, word or any historical significance given to the evacuation was just a mere footnote uh, in most history books. It was a, um, a most, the, the word, those that were in turn wanted to forget about it and move on. Was there any still restriction that placed on Japanese-American 
um, after the after the evacuation, like when you get out of the camp, was there any restriction? No, the war was over, essentially over, so you could go back as best you can to restore your your you know pre-war life as best you could. Um, and a lot of people did. Um, since they lost everything, they had to work very hard to get back up to the, um, the standard of living that they had prior to the evacuation. Some people did very successfully. Others uh, you know, had to remake themselves all over. So it was, it was it was relatively hard times for for some people. Thank you so much for spending time with us here today, telling many great stories, and we really appreciate it. No, okay, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs>